Welcome to our distinguished panelists and uh, welcome to our attendees. Um, my name is Mariam Sumare. I am a trade policy analyst in the accessions division of the WTO. Um, and uh, today we're going to be talking about LDC's accession. So throughout the week we held uh, enriched, enriching webinars covering various topics related to WTO accession. If you've been tuning in, we covered the WTO accession process, we covered bilateral market access negotiations, and we also held experience sharing sessions with negotiators. So this session is more or less a continuation of, of the discussions. Uh, the session is entitled The Essential Elements of LDC's Accession. Um, so if you've been tuning in, you would know that it should be no secret to you that WTO accessions are complex. Uh, they require reform, which means change, and change is inherently difficult. But despite the complexities, uh, we had 36 governments which concluded their accessions pursuant to Article 12 of the Marrakesh Agreement, the so-called Article 12 members. And these include nine LDCs. These are Cambodia and Nepal in 2004, Cabo Verde in 2008, Samoa and Vanuatu in 2012, Lao PDR in 2013, Yemen in 2014, Afghanistan and Liberia in 2016. So the duration of their accessions averaged to about 12 years and six months, uh, which is slightly longer than the overall average duration for all Article 12 members, which is roughly at 10 years and two months. And currently, right now, we have 23 exceeding government uh, that are joining the WTO. And out of this, we have eight that are LDCs. And these are Bhutan, Comoros, Ethiopia, Sao Tome and Principe, Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, and Timor-Leste. <laughs> so with this little background, um, the main objective of this session is to really have an open discussion between exceeding government. So here we have uh, Timor-Leste and Ethiopia. So those that are going through the process and Article 12 members. So those that have already gone through the process and here we have Yemen and Afghanistan. So you, the panelists will discuss the challenges that LDCs face during accession and how to overcome them. So today we're honored to have four distinguished panelists. Um, I will introduce them starting with acceding governments. So uh, we'll start with Timor-Leste, but um, Francisco, welcome. I see that you just joined us. Um, so unfortunately, due to personal commitments, His Excellency Fidelis Madelaj, uh, uh cannot join us today, but we are honored to have Mr. Francisco with Chargé d'Affaires at the permanent mission of Timor-Leste in, in Geneva. Uh, Mr. Francisco has been involved in the WTO accession of Timor-Leste, which officially started in 2016. Welcome, uh, Francisco. Um, then uh, we have a uh, Garam Yu. Garam we're honored to have you here. You are the Minister Counselor at the Permanent Mission of Ethiopia in Geneva. And Garam has been involved in uh, Ethiopia's accession from the very start, since 2003. Uh, you, uh, you are and still, you are still involved in all aspects of Ethiopia's accession negotiations. So welcome, Garam now, Article 12 members, those that have gone through the accession process. And we have Najib with us today. So Najib currently works at the permanent mission of Yemen to the uh, UNOG uh, as an economic attaché on WTO affairs. And uh, previously, you were chief of communication and the coordination office with the WTO at the Ministry of Industry and Trade of Yemen. And uh, during those times, you were responsible for Yemen WTO accession dossiers at the experts level. Um, and as, as the accession process advanced, you were stationed in Geneva to closely follow up on the completion of the accession. And the accession was officially completed in 2014. So uh, welcome, Najib, and we look forward to receiving your insights today. Um, last but definitely not least, we have Mr. Mozamil Shinwari. Uh, Mr. Mozamil is the founder and executive director of the Organization of Economic Studies and Peace. Uh, this is an Afghan NGO focusing on peace through economic activities. And uh, Mr. Mozamil was Deputy Minister of Commerce and Industries of Afghanistan between 2011 and 2016. 
and during that time, uh, he served as chief trade negotiator for Afghanistan's uh, WTO accession, which was which was successfully led to conclusion in 2016. Thank you, thank you, and welcome. Uh, it's an honor to have you. So, uh, with that introduction, um, I would just like to kick off the discussion and. Uh, I would kick off the discussion with uh, one basic and simple question. It may sound simple, but in answering it, it may not be that simple. Um, my first question is to all speakers, why did your country apply for WTO accession? And this question, I will start with exceeding government. I will start with Timor Leste. Mr. Francisco, please tell us. Uh, thank you very much for your question. It's a really pertinent uh, question because you know that Timor Leste is uh, uh, just, you know, uh, yeah. I would say that it's an independent, new, newly independent country. But here, uh, let me to introduce to you that uh, um, the program of eight constitutional uh, governments, it's commit Timor Leste to finalize this accession process as a full member of the WTO. And uh, the government will continue to implement uh, measures to regulate commercial activity and improve policy to expand uh, markets, including dissemination of economic, value-added product, and through various uh, strategies that promote Timor Leste interest and its product in the region and the world. It means that integrated ourselves to uh, war economic and regional economic. And currently, we are also in the process of accession to ASEAN. Uh, that is uh, um, the main objective of this, uh, this current government. And then the initiative to join WTO is a really strategic choice. One, move the economy toward better uh, governance. Second is promote trade growth by securing market access for Timorese export. And third, foster economic prosperity that works for everyone. And then the fourth, uh, create a smart and uh, agile uh, business environment based on the predictability and certainty and efficiency of the regulation. Timor Leste expect to achieve some strategic objective uh, with WTO membership, namely accession aligned with much needed domestic reform and improvement of Timorese legislation, so export pools and export performance of our economy and commitment to rule of law, and accession enhanced Timor Leste international stature and leadership position the country as being ready and attractive for business. Accession has uh, overheard that could eventually boost trade promotion and improve investment, climate, industry, export and service sector, etc. etc. Then also a benefit of join are clear as it will grant Timor Leste normal trade relation with 164 countries and improve its access to foreign, um, foreign markets. So that's uh, you know, part of this uh, first question. I think uh, this is uh, the, the, the main objective, how we uh, join, uh, join WTO. And as, as well as also, we're looking forward to join the group, I mean, among the group, uh, uh, the region that we are taking part, that ASEAN. Thank you very much, Francisco. Um, clearly, Timor Leste uh, believes in the values of the multilateral trading system and you're also using the WTO accession process as a stepping stone to deeper uh, regional integration, which is the ASEAN uh, integration. So um, um, I will now pass the floor to Geremu. Geremu, please tell us why Ethiopia applied to join the WTO. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the accession division for organizing this uh, accession week. Uh, we learn a lot about accession, and uh, I, I can confess that uh, I learned a lot from the previous uh, sessions. Uh, the experience of uh, you know uh, other countries, the need for why to be a WTO member, and the challenges also. Now it came to our turn to say something uh, why Ethiopia is uh, 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 applying for accession. First of all, uh, since the 
uh, it's kind of brief and uh, for the first time that uh, a person is, is associated with trade organization. That is the first thing. And WTO is becoming a forum, a rulemaking uh, forum for the international trade. Uh, it's better to be uh, part of the rule maker rather than a rule taker. So uh, it's not, you know, as we did now, uh, once we are a member of the uh, WTO, we are not going to sit at the corner and speak last. So uh, it is good to, to be part of the rule maker uh, and defend our interests in the rulemaking process to make uh, these rules uh, take care of our, uh, our situation, we have to be part of it. And that is the first uh, thing that we decided to be uh, the uh, part of the rulemaking uh, system. Second, whether we like it or not, we are trading with all trading partners. And the rules and regulations that apply to the international trade equally apply on us. So whether we like it or not, that rule is on applying on us. So we have to exercise that role, also being part of the system. And uh, third, uh, as it is repeatedly said, invest, it will uh, boost investors' uh, confidence. Yes, of course, investors consider different conditions to invest in one's uh, country, but part being WTO member is sometimes used as a litmus paper whether that country is applying uh, international rules uh, uh, without discrimination and uh, is compatible to, it is trading system is compatible to the uh, international trade. So we have to prove that our system, whether it, even though we believe that our uh, trading uh, activity, our trading rules are compatible, but we have to prove by being a member. And uh, finally, uh, 98% of the uh, world trade is among WTO members. And being out of that system uh, is almost uh, being, you know, uh, out of the play. So we have to be part of the system that incorporates almost 90, oh, 98 or I can say 100% because uh, 164 members are, mem uh, are now members. Uh, there, there are another 23 are in the process. So being part of that system will ensure us, you know, to play our role in the international system. That is, those are the basic uh, uh, reasons that we are applying, but for most countries, <laughs> pro multilateralism from the very beginning from the very beginning of the league of nation ethiopia is one of the uh, uh, member of uh, uh, the league of nation and the promoter of uh, multilateralism let me stop here thanks a lot Jeremy. I, I really liked your saying when you said that uh, you'd rather be a rule maker than rather than a rule taker um, Ethiopia has been in the process of accession since 2003, WTO accession, but we know that the country has been for multilateralism even before. And uh, here at the WTO Secretariat, we were pleased to see Ethiopia's renewed engagement in its accession process in the past few months. So we hope it continues that way. Uh, now I would uh, turn to uh, uh, Article 12 members, those that have successfully uh, completed the WTO accession. And uh, I will uh, start with uh, Yemen. Najib, please tell us why Yemen decided to join the WTO. 
Yes, good morning uh, all. And thank you for inviting also Yemen to uh, talk to our friends from accession uh, countries. And uh, the question on why a country is joining WTO, including Yemen in this case, if you examine almost all accessions, you will find one key reason. And you mentioned it at the beginning. The key word is reform. And this is exactly what happened in the case of Yemen. I'm lucky to uh, share you know, Yemen's experience from the very, very beginning, early before even starting accession. Back in 1995, actually, we started on this famous structure adjustment uh, program with the assistance of IMF and, uh, and the World Bank. And we had a local version of this uh, program uh, to reform, you know, the economic, administrative, financial, all aspects of life. And one important aspect that we discussed then, 95, that was the accession to the WTO. WTO was, uh, as we all know, started January 95. So later in that year, we started thinking of how to join this important you know, organization. So, and the, the reason was reform actually. Uh, and then we started, you know, during that reform process, uh, we started talking about every aspect of reform that uh, a country can embark on. Uh, trade, of course, was a major aspect. And we started, you know, examining what do we have in practice, be it in the uh, legislative or practical uh, aspects of conducting trade in general and, uh, in, and, and foreign trade in particular. Uh, so uh, during this examination process, we thought that we have many things to reform. And we started addressing different aspects, changing laws, uh, regulations uh, and and also uh, uh, carrying uh, an awareness cam campaign with different stakeholders in the country and uh, of course after doing or going through this process uh, there is always this uh, important aspect or element uh, when you talk with with experts uh, from IMF or the World Bank or independent experts there is this uh, jargon what they use lock in reforms results because if you do reform you can always go back and uh, forget about the reforms that you have done and you start afresh but if you lock in those reform results uh, that will help the country to go forward and that's what exactly what we did because Joining the WTO is exactly that, covering that missing part, which is locking in the reform uh, results. Uh, of course, I mean, there are uh, uh, many other reasons, but that was the uh, main and the first uh, reason that you will find actually in every, almost every acceding, uh, developing or least developed country. Least developed country. Uh, because you see, after all, you see uh, the 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 reform and the results, you know, and and being a WTO member uh, will will give you strength. Will will as as our friend from Ethiopia just mentioned, you know, like being in the system, of course, is always better than being out of it. Uh, after all, you know, most of the uh, countries around the world are members of the WTO, and you are trading with them. So if you do not trade with them on the same rules and principles that all we all agree on, then you will be left outside, marginalized, and if not, you know, to be like a dumping ground, if you will, of the rest of the world, because you do not apply those rules and you do not benefit from uh, those rules and, and, and agreements. Uh, if you have a problem, uh, dumping as, as an example, uh, you can talk bilaterally, but if you are a member of the WTO, you talk uh, bilaterally, but if the problem is not solved, you are always having this other option to go to 
the WTO uh, mechanism that will help you to uh, solve this, uh, this uh, such a problem. Uh, of course, I mean, in every accession also, there are, there are uh, tangible benefits that every country is aspired to. Investment, and also heard that, uh, that's very important to our countries. I mean, uh, but who will come to invest in your country if it is not part of this international system that guarantees rights for investors uh, and, and also attracts the uh, investors from abroad and even from from nationals i mean we have many nationals who are who prefer to invest outside rather than inside the country uh, but if you are uh, having you know those commitments uh, through accession or membership of wto then they have this comfort of coming and invest in, in your country uh, it's more like a, a stamp of reliability you know if you are a member of wto that tells a lot that you are applying those rules and if you do not apply them you can be taken to court so it's not just a, a matter of uh, a gesture that you are applying but rather uh, committing to those things uh, so then again i mean as i said that was early when we started thinking of accession uh, we we had you know uh, of course the government at the time uh, had you know those plans that uh, uh, all you know uh, trade practices and of course legislation uh, need to be uh, revised uh, improved and to to be more uh, predictable and transparent so all these things actually comes with accession to the WTO uh, again there are of course uh, certain issues to do with other benefits even even market access i mean uh, uh, though it's not a big issue in yemen's accession uh, because we are relying on few commodities to, uh, to export but yet i mean there were some and still uh, some obstacles again to to uh, overcome those obstacles when you are a member of wto it's much easier and uh, way to to do so uh, instead of doing bilateral with countries that you may not get uh, the problem solved you know because you are not uh, you know in a position you know to 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 uh, defend your your interests so if you are a member of wto you can do that and of course and i will limit uh, this to one more reason is uh, when you are a member of wto there are rights of course there are rights in, in, in addition to the obligations that you take during accession, you end up also with certain rights. So you want to exercise those rights and how you to exercise them, it's only through being a member of the WTO. So again, to summarize, there are many reasons, uh, but from reading you know, the experiences of different countries, I found out that the, the, the common thread, if you will, is reform and then uh, other uh, reasons and some are very particular to certain uh, countries but in general uh, i think you know uh, we have similar similar reasons uh, to be a member of the wto especially as a as an ldc uh, countries with similar uh, you know uh, situations thank you thank you very much najib you have raised some um excellent points, uh, particularly on reform. And, and my take on what you just said is that, that Yemen saw as much value in the accession process, uh, and same for WTO membership, to be able to lock in reform, and that is the benefits of the process it, itself, and then becoming members and benefiting from the rights of WTO membership. Thanks a lot. Um, now I'll move on to Mozamil. Um, Mozamil, the same question to you. Afghanistan is one of our latest uh, uh, exiting government, just the baby of the WTO. <coughs> so uh, please tell us, uh, what was the reason um, that Afghanistan joined the WTO? Uh, thank you, Mariam, um, and thanks to the Accession Division for inviting me again to this program. I think we had a very good one in the um, uh, two days ago on the um, overall accession, but today is about the LDC's accession. Uh, just to tell you about uh, Afghanistan, um, 
In 2004, Afghanistan adopted new constitution um, in, in Article 10 and 11 of Afghanistan constitution. It was clearly mentioned that the economy or the economic system of Afghanistan uh, will be market economy. So that when we look to the overall uh, development or overall any um, domestic reform and everything in the private sector development in overall economic development, we focus on the Article 10 and Article 11 of our new constitution. Because before that, it was Taliban regime. We didn't have any proper economic system. Um, and uh, before that, uh, it was the state-run economy mostly. But everything got changed. And based on that, we move ahead with the new uh, economic system. And we were not able between 2004 and somehow we can say till 2011, 12, that to develop those laws, which reflect the overall economic um, system that was uh, enshrined in our constitution. And that was the reason that we applied at that time to uh, become a member of the World Trade Organization. If you look to our application system, uh, the first we applied in 2004, but it was uh, quite unfortunate that till 2009, we, we didn't do anything in the uh, accession process. In 2009, we submitted our MFTR to the World Trade Organization. And again, there was a pause for two years. So the actual work was started in 2011. There are several reasons for that. As every um, you know, other speaker, they mentioned about the domestic reform. This was also one of our main reasons to do um, Afghanistan accession to World Trade Organization to have the domestic reform. Um, that means that we wanted um, um, to have legal system, proper system, which is according to our constitution, and we will be able uh, to do um, or to have the economic relation uh, with the, inter, uh, the international community in other countries that we are having. Um, second thing, um, as a landlocked country, we always face problem with the uh, transit issue. That was the second issue that we wanted to utilize Article 5 of the GATT, freedom of transit, um, and that the assurance of the freedom of transit uh, can come to us through, the, uh, through becoming a member of the World Trade Organization. And that was the second reason that if um, the countries that uh, we are uh, trading with are transiting through, um, if we face any problem that we can use the dispute settlement process, which is also one of the uh, uh, beauty of the World Trade Organization, that uh, you can utilize the dispute settlement process if the problems are not solved. Even it's expensive, but still this is an option that uh, you might go um, ahead with that. Third thing, um, uh, we wanted um, uh, to um, have the overall um, confidence of the other member countries in Afghanistan because once you are a member of WTO, um, you have to follow certain rules, certain, um, you know, the principles of the WTO, you have to adopt that. And based on that, you know, uh, that can increase the confidence of the other uh, countries, which will lead to the another reason that we um, uh, work for it is the foreign direct investment because until you don't have confidence in any country you don't go for investment in that country and that's why um, as Afghanistan is uh, quite rich in terms of the raw material we have minerals um, you know you name any uh, mineral um, that exists in the world you will find it in Afghanistan um, take it from the you know the most um, um, expensive one or rare earth mineral, um, you can name it palladium, lithium, uranium, all those things that um, you know you can find it in Afghanistan. We have oil and gas, we have uh, copper in iron, we have uh, all kind of gemstones uh, from emeralds to lapis, so every rubies and everything is there in Afghanistan. So, you know, it's a kind of a paradise for the investors to come and invest, but for that, there are several. A prerequisite. One, of course, the security is a major issue. Still, we are having problem with it, um, but hopefully it will improve. Second, um, you should have that confidence in the overall system built for that. In that system, we thought at that time it will be built through our accession to WTO because we will have system in place, we will have laws in place, and we will give assurance to the um, investors coming to Afghanistan. Um, again, the market access was one of the issues, but it was not of the major reason that uh, we can uh, get access to the uh, market of 
163 um, countries that they acceded uh, to WTO before that. And also the other um, advantages that the developed countries um, under the WTO, they have given to the LDCs, um, you know, duty-free, quota-free access to their market, mostly, for example, um, European Union that they, they have given to LDCs. So these were the other, um, you know, incentive that uh, we always wanted um, to become a member. But um, the most important, what I mentioned at the start, domestic reform, domestic reform was not only in the legal side, which was quite important. Uh, we developed 30 uh, plus uh, legal document, which include laws, regulation, and everything that related to the private sector development and attracting the foreign direct investment. But at the same time, reforming in their procedures. You know, in our last session, Cecilia indirectly mentioned, Cecilia Klein, a former uh, Director General WTO, she mentioned that a country, for example, with more than 30 uh, steps to acquire um, uh, a business license, which is uh, um, a, a kind of not a legitimate document that to have it. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, the same situation with us. Like you, you had to go through 30 signatures or 20 plus signatures to, to, to acquire a document which is somehow not needed for, for you because you just needed a registration to pay the taxes. So this is some kind of thing that we wanted to address those things. Like for exporting, we, we required around 12 to 13 documents just in order to export a simple thing. That was not in favor of our country. So what we, we did, the whole you know, accession process, we utilized that um, in order to reform those processes and procedures um, to improve our export, uh, to enhance our trade. At the same time, we were having problem in uh, import. Uh, so import related, you know, several hurdles were there, uh, which was making the uh, cost of doing with Af a business with Afghanistan was much higher. So, so those are the uh, main reasons. So uh, in simple, that um, first thing, um, as um, our president in the meeting with the delegation of the WTO before our final working party, um, um, so uh, those they visited the, at that time, the director of the um, accession division and also our um, uh, working party chair, ambassador of Netherlands, they visited Kabul and they had a meeting with our president. So our president clearly said that, through um, accession to the World Trade Organization, I want to implement the market economy in Afghanistan. I will stop here um, and uh, we'll be looking forward to further discussion. Thanks a lot, Mozamil. You have raised uh, some good points um, and, and you have raised some reasons that are pretty particular to Afghanistan, uh, besides reform, which is to, to move towards a market economy, um, as well as to benefit from uh, the GATT provisions on freedom of transit, uh, which was very particular to Afghanistan, given that it is a landlocked country. Um, thank you all for your answer to this question. Um, I ask this because just to, to show that clearly each of your countries saw value in the WTO accession, process and WTO membership, and that's why you decided to embark on it, um, knowing that it wouldn't be an easy ride. So let's get to the core of our discussion today, which is to discuss the challenges that are faced by LBCs. And I will start with our current acceding governments, because those are our priorities. They are the ones who are going through the accession process. Um, I'm going to ask, um, what are the challenges to both Timor Leste and, and Ethiopia? What are the challenges that the main challenge, let's just call it the main challenge that your country is experiencing in its accession process? And what is being done to overcome them? I will start with Timor Leste. Francesco. Okay, uh, thank you for the, the, the questions. Uh, before I, I, I'll, I'll answer to the, co the, to the challenge, uh, answer to the challenge, I would like also to uh, mention some of a point regarding the central problem and the issue that uh, accession are. One is uh, striking the right balance between uh, respecting uh, WTO rules and the need to preserve and accomplish legitimate uh, national development uh, objectives. As, as a least developed country, our strategy is uh, this term demand a mix of national economic uh, interest and development principle and goals and also uh, the foreign policy objectives. And second point is um, we concern is 
considering our special economic situation and development needs as LDC country that we encourage the, the, the development of our production uh, capacity with industrialization, then a structural uh, transformation and diverse, diversification of the Timorese economy. It is vital that, uh, vital that uh, we are able to reaffirm and simplify and streamline accession procedure, which allow the pro appropriate flex 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 flexibility in the area of the market access and WTO rule, in according with the ministerial conference decision and guideline on accession of LDC uh, country. Third is uh, concern is identify and developing the appropriate and most uh, effective capacity building program that's cover all of the stage of the accession process as the process move on for Timor-Leste, effective support would be required for setting up legislative, the legislative and institutional architecture and enforcement uh, mechanism. So what is uh, being done to overcome the, this, those challenges? First, that we are taking into account the different decision of the eight or nine and 11 uh, ministerial conference and, and guidelines, among others, apply to LDCs. Second, we are mobilized and active and as a whole of the government approach domestically to make the process more technically feasible. Early on the institute uh, instituted a working group at the highest um, level of the of the government, involving all relevant institutions. Uh, in, in this case, is a coordinating Minister of Economic Affairs, Ministry of uh, Trade, Industry and Commerce, and Ministry of Finance, Customs, and Ministry of Agriculture, and also the technical teams. And the third, uh, to overcome this challenge, that uh, we are preparing bankable a project for technical assistance with the enhanced integrated framework to support the development of study, training and preparation of documentation, policy proposal and draft legislation. We also have partnership with other relevant multilateral and regional organizations. So all of this, the, you know, I mentioned that uh, the challenges we're trying to overcome uh, as uh, related to your question, what we, we have to do to, do to, to respond to those, uh, all, uh, to those uh, challenges. So I think, uh, I think from the standing that uh, just uh, gives the, this answer of, of your question. Okay. Thanks a lot, Francesco. And uh, it's, it's good to see that uh, Timor Leste is taking active steps to, to overcome, especially uh, uh, lack of um, uh, capacity, uh, technical capacity or financial capacities uh, through the EIF and other development partners. Um, I will move on to uh, Garamu. Garamu, please let us know uh, what is the main challenge Ethiopia is facing in its succession process as an LDC. Uh, and what is your country doing currently to overcome those challenges? Well, good. <clears throat> Thank you, Mariam. Uh, well, in my view, um, the challenge of uh, accession in general, uh, accession of LDCs, is uh, the uh, system itself. Uh, I'm saying that uh, uh, the Marrakesh Agreement in the preamble recognizes the need for uh, positive effort to ensure developing countries, especially the least developed countries, secure a share in the growth of international trade that commensurate with the level of economic development, their economic development. Equally, Article 12 of the same agreement requires accession to be to the WTO be based on terms to be agreed between acceding member and through negotiation. In this regard, countries are expected to offer reasonable concessions that commensurate with their individual development, finance, and trade levels. While there are special provisions in the agreements that uh, are uh, uh, applicable to the LDC succession. Special provisions are also supporting uh, LDC succession. Experience showed that a limited human, institutional, financial, and administrative capacity of LDCs makes LDCs succession more challenging. 
we are the, the, the agreement itself requires accession is through negotiation. And at the same time, LDCs have these limited capacities, both financial, human, institutional uh, uh, capacity. I think the challenges are even more aggravated as the size of members membership increase and the appetite and uh, the need for market wider market access is increasing so uh, members rather than looking the uh, ldc's capacity to negotiate to liberalize and uh, uh, integrate into the system they mainly focus on the market access they deserve. So these are the major challenges that uh, 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 LDC face. I think to overcome these challenges of accession of LDCs and facilitate speedy and smooth integration of the multi to the multilateral system, members should commit themselves and respect the, the principles that uh, uh, the usually say universalizing the multilateral trading system and not to let anyone left out of the system. So these are the, 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 the this should be taken into consideration by members during negotiation to speed up and uh, facilitate LDC certification. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Guillermo. Um, I would now like to uh, pass the floor to uh, our Article 12 members. Uh, both Yemen and Afghanistan um, joined the WTO as LDCs, but not only that, but as, as conflict-affected uh, LDCs. So it, I, I'm sure your accession process, you during your accession process, you face layers upon layers of challenges. So do any of the challenges raised by uh, Timor-Leste and Ethiopia sound familiar to you? And, and what would you say, uh, what would you advise uh, Timor-Leste and Ethiopia? I would start with Yemen. Yes, uh, actually, uh, when we started, you know, uh, the question why we acceded to WGO, uh, we found out that the reasons are very similar. You know, we have from uh, also exceeding, two exceeding representatives, and they were similar in many ways. Of course, there are certain uh, unique aspects to each in some cases. Uh, similarly, also challenges are very, very close uh, to, to what we have experienced. For instance, I heard Timor Leste's uh, referencing to uh, balance uh, and also the uh, capacity building, uh, you know, uh, having, you know, a national mechanism of coordination, uh, also uh, securing uh, resources, like mentioning the EIF. Again, I mean, these are similar because you see the overall objective of any accession at the end of the game is to try to reach a balanced rights and obligations so you are negotiating and you are making obligations to, through through that uh, negotiating process uh, in the meantime in back in your head always thinking without asking because if you ask you will not get a reply what i'm getting out of this i mean uh, where is the balance and the balance is always decided by the acceding government if it feels that okay, we have reached this far. I think we are achieving some kind of balance between rights and obligations. As, as we all know, rights mostly embodied in the agreements, in the commitments of the uh, existing members. Uh, so you don't uh, ask your negotiating partners uh, for, for what is for it for us in return because it's there already. So you need to examine those things uh, in order to reach a decision that, okay, we are nearing the balance uh, aspect. Now, 
uh, again, as, as uh, mentioned uh, uh, by our colleagues, you know, from uh, Timor Leste and Ethiopia, uh, there is this dilemma actually between what the rules or the agreements say, giving a fair uh, treatment uh, for LDCs, uh, not only in the accession process, but beyond when they can also become uh, members and the way how to achieve accession it's based solely on negotiations and negotiations meaning making commitments and concessions making uh, taking obligations and as uh, our friend from Ethiopia uh, he will also see this more like in coming weeks and, and months like as if we are there only to pay our dues to become a member and that those dues are mostly through concessions and commitments on goods and services and other aspects of course i mean the uh, trips uh, etc uh, so uh, the, the, there is a problem here we have few tools you know to to uh, mitigate uh, this dilemma like the guidelines for for LDC accessions uh, but still i mean uh, you need more i mean i give you an example for instance challenge of challenge we had uh, at the towards the end of the our accession we had only one member left to conclude bilateral agreement with and that took believe it or not more than a year and a half I and mean, uh, we were circling in the same uh, area and then luckily because there is this uh, good offices uh, you know reference in the guidelines of the uh, director general of WTO we applied for that we said we can't reach an agreement with this uh, good member of the WTO so uh, he established you know kind of uh, a group uh, of the chairpersons of and not only Yemen, actually, we had also Lao BDR in the same boat. So, chairpersons of Lao and Yemen, uh, and uh, the, the group is chaired by the subcommittee of LDCs. Uh, of course, uh, represented also by uh, the two uh, acceding countries. So, that took, uh, take, or took rather a uh, few months also. And then finally, we signed. Uh, so you see, you know, there is this uh, sometimes uh, challenge that you do not expect. Uh, and this could arise in any coming uh, accession. So if this happens, you have this precedent that there is this good offices, uh, DG good offices, you know, uh, way to mitigate it. Uh, but in, in overall, you know, many of the challenges also are inside the country not necessarily with members outside uh, coordination for instance uh, negotiations it's themselves mostly start at home you can't go to sit with with with, with partners you know uh, who are demanding certain uh, concessions and commitments before you agree within your country that this is our uh, options you know to give uh, concessions or commitments you can just walk into a meeting and see what they are asking then you reply no you have to prepare preparation is very important but then we have always in our case and uh, ldc's case the limitation of resources be it human or financial uh, we were lucky in yemen's case we had the support financially uh, from the eu with a project you know for uh, like uh, several years up to 7 million uh, euros so it's important for LDCs to have similar maybe uh, um, resources uh, and I said financially because the decisions should be national decisions I mean uh, the, the experts you know uh, the, the uh, partners who are supporting you financially need not to be or to interfere in the choices of the government the government decides what to accept what not to accept what to offer and what not to offer it's not up to the experts you know they can always you know kind of give you advice but it's it's not always and we had this you know very much in the case of yemen we had many advices but at the end of the day you sit 
as a country, as a government, and decide, is this a good thing to follow? Is this a, uh, a good uh, option to offer, etc.? So challenges, again, I mean, I mean they are very uh, similar, uh, but it's important, you know, to have a solid uh, uh, mechanism within the country, uh, connection with the uh, with Geneva mission, that's very important. Uh, we Since we started in 2000, the accession process, we had always one person stationed in Geneva, at least. We can't afford more. So there is a connection with the WTO Secretariat, with Geneva, and then you take it, you know, gradually until you hopefully conclude your accession. I'll stop here, but it's a, a big story challenges, of course. Thank you very much, Najib. Indeed, uh, it is a big story challenges. There are many, and you were able to, to give some solid advice to uh, our current succeeding governments. Um, Mazamil, I'll turn to you. Um, do you relate to any of the uh, challenges raised by uh, Garamu and Francisco? Um, and if yes, how, what would you advise them? Of course, um, you know, most of the LDCs, they're facing the similar challenges yeah. and the similar problems uh, in the process. Um, of course, the first one is uh, capacity. Um, you know, normally when you start WTO accession, you don't have experts in WTOs in your country. Or hardly you have anyone, uh, when you are observer, they went to Geneva, attended the WTO um, training program, and they got some knowledge. That is the, the basic thing that you have. You don't have that many experts in the country that they can come and sit. Um, you know, they said, you, you know, I'm going to negotiate uh, this accession. So it's, it's always um, a, big, a big challenge. So before going to the uh, negotiation tables, I think building capacity, that is one of the biggest challenge. Um, and it's not easy because first you have to pick the team um, and building a team in LDCs, um, it's the most difficult thing in your country. Because if you choose one person from a specific ministry, that might not be the person that minister of that ministry want uh, that person to be in the negotiation. Uh, but maybe you, you need a technical person who understands things and all those things, but a minister might want some, someone else. So that is becoming an issue until you bring that consensus with the ministries and find the suitable people. Then investing in those people, it's always a challenge because uh, you need to send them and you don't have that much um, a kind of resources that you can do that. So my advice will be to the acceding members, to sit with the training division of the WTO, utilize that to the maximum level, because that is something that um, is there for you for free. Uh, you can utilize them, you can take that. For example, in my case, when we were negotiating, I used to go to the, uh, to the training division and sit with them. Uh, I used to tell them that, okay, I need that many people to be accepted to this program, to be accepted to this program. Sometimes already a kind of timeline was passed for a certain program, for example, trade policy or um, trade facilitation or intellectual property, I would go and tell them that, okay, I need two additional scenes. They said, it's not possible. And I said, no, I need these things. I need these people. So this is something that you can push for it. You don't wait always for what they're giving you. You should go to them. And what I found, um, I found them quite friendly and they always supported us in the process. Um, and they gave me most of the time, um, you know, one or two additional people that, okay, they can participate because when you are exceeding, you are the priority. So go and look for them and ask for them and take that. Second thing about the technical assistance, which is quite important. As I told you, you normally don't have that capacity to develop those things. You need international expert to work with you. But the issue become here that how you can utilize those experts. That is becoming the big, that is the biggest issue with the LDCs. Normally, um, some countries I found that the technical assistance came in a way that they were directing everything to the uh, member country. And because of not having that much knowledge about, um, you know, those processes, they were accepting things and that is becoming a headache for them at the end of the day. For example, we, we faced some, some of the issues uh, early in 2005, 2006, 
um, we were getting the support, uh, technical assistance to develop an MFTR. And many things were put in MFTR that later on for us while we were negotiating, it was quite difficult to, to understand it or quite difficult to negotiate it or quite difficult just uh, to look how to justify that. So these are the issues that the technical assistance when it's coming to you, you should sit with them. What is your priority and what is their priority? Normally, you know, they say they come with a broader statement that I want to support you in this process. I would like to do this thing, this thing. But you as a government should take lead, not the donor should take lead. That is the main issue. For example, with us, a thank to the support of the all international community that they were supporting us in the process, but mainly the United States, the USAID, they were uh, providing us technical support. For example, in dealing with them, I had two conditions. First, I told them, look, come and sit with me. I want these things. What is your program? Let's put it together, make it together, and make it a joint program. So annual program, when we were setting any target, I would set the same which was the same for the UCID project. So I would submit it to my president, my minister, and I said, I want to do these things this year. So at the end of the year, I, I was supposed to answer those things if it is not met, and they were supposed. So we made it a joint effort, and that helped us in the process. Second thing, while bringing expert, I put a condition on the, um, uh, the UCID project, and I said, look, if you are bringing one international expert, you have to have hire two locals to work with them. And I don't want full-time expert. I want, I want uh, you know, these young Afghan that they will be working with them as on a full-time, but international experts should be on a need base because the resources you are spending on international expert, you should spend it on the local people. You know, I face resistance from that, but I pushed for it and, and I managed to get that. So that was quite good because most of those technical people that they were working on that project, later on, I brought them into the system, into the ministry to work um, uh, with us. Um, third difficulties that we face, and maybe that will be the challenge for that. Normally, Ministry of Commerce, um, um, Ministry of Trade, or in some countries, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they're leading the trade negotiation. But, you know, it's not only the job of that ministry, it is the job of the complete government. And you face problem with the relevant ministry because something might be priority for you as a negotiation team or the chief negotiator or the accession process, but that might not be the case in the relevant ministry as a priority. So they will be just staying behind that. For example, if you are going for the SPS related laws, maybe um, Ministry of Agriculture and Ministry of Public Health will say, oh, for me right now, uh, you know, the priority is to have the hospital, this and that, this and that, not to work on the SPS related issues and all those things. So, you know, just, just an example. So that has become always an issue. And especially drafting the laws, you should push them all the time. Okay, we need to do this thing. And again, that will be say, okay, we have several other laws they're lining up before that. You know, I don't, you know, don't have to push for this and that. So that internal work is quite difficult. You have to coordinate it. You have to work, you have to go to them, work with them and try to get that technical assistance to your ministry, the similar kind of assistance you get to that ministry that they will be, um, you know, specialized um, in that area. Again, the reforms inside the countries, like the procedures, you know, it's always, always difficult when you want to change the status quo. Um, you know, people will come against you, they will uh, stop, you know, you know, cooperating with you because maybe because of certain reforms, especially when, when we look internally, they, there might be a conflict of interest for those individuals in that reform. So they might be opposing them, they might be creating hurdles for that, they might be doing all those things. So that's why, you know, in certain reforms, you have to take um, in confidence your government especially your economic committee of the cabinet, your cabinet, even the president office to utilize those things um, in order to move ahead with that. But, you know, overall, um, you know, at the end of the process, when you finish, um, in that most of the NBCs are suffering from it, um, um, is that when you finish the accession, the, uh, accession process, when you become member, um, you, you get a kind of um, a 
change in the whole uh, negotiation team um, are they displaced are they brain drained they are taken by some international organization and work for them so you lose that institutional memory and that is creating lots of problem for you in the post accession process you know because the people will come that they don't have that much information about the process of negotiation what you have done um and they would come with certain ideas that it might oppose it might create conflict it might create a kind of confusion inside the government and then implementation of the process and utilizing that uh, negotiation uh, process that you manage or the deal you got through the negotiation that is becoming um, a big issue so these are the problem that you know we face in um, like especially with the post accession uh, most of the people they were involved overall in the government because of the political change um, they lost their position or they were not in the same position so in implementation we are uh, facing problem so uh, coming to the last point which is quite important ldcs uh, we normally don't have a stable political environment and that is one of the biggest challenge that we are facing uh, even before starting negotiation during negotiation and also uh, post accession so these are the thing that um, you know normally we face that um, so uh, we have to keep it in mind all those thing while we are doing negotiation i will stop here thanks a lot mozamil um you have answered their questions uh, and even beyond um indeed um seeking for technical assistance and especially uh targeted and coordinated uh, uh technical assistance is is important and, and on our part in the who uh, secretariat we we remain ready as always to provide assistance to exceeding ldcs we understand your challenges and we 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 are always ready to assist and and i think this is why we also organize uh, events such as the accession events is to accession week is to boost the general knowledge on who accession to all exceeding government uh, even uh, during the exceptional exceptional circumstances such as the uh, covid-19 um now let us move on to the next part of of this session um thank you for answering this question and i'm sure um each of you probably has a burning question that you would like to ask to another speaker um now i would like to give the floor to um first see more less to ask a question uh, or a follow up question following what uh, najib and and mozamil have said uh, that you would like to ask to anyone please um the floor is yours francisco thank you um Uh, here that uh, i'd like to raise some question here is um uh, uh wto uh, uh is what's the question uh what was the most critical uh, decision or set of the decision for successful and rapid uh, conclusion of your accession Uh, sorry, to whom are you addressing this question to? To both. To uh, to Afghanistan. To Afghanistan. Um, okay. Um, you know um, the major thing uh, the, which resulted in rapid uh, conclusion. Uh, even we 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 were supposed to finish by 2013, but you know because of um, one member countries that um, you know. it didn't happen even we we were like the um, active negotiation uh, would have been from 2011 january 2011 till 2013 because by 2013 we finished all uh, bilateral market um, you know access uh, bilateral negotiation in um, also so the, in rules area we we had some uh, issues but um, later on we finished one reason uh, we when we started we were realistic realistic in terms we didn't want uh, you know um to go uh, to the level for example our applied uh, rate um um in the when we were working on the bound rates our applied rate was quite low and we didn't want to go much higher that like we negotiate and negotiate and bring it uh, down so first thing we followed the ldc guidelines even 
um, at the end of the day, uh, we use that as a kind of pressure tool, but it didn't help us in actual, uh, because the member country, they came and they sat with us and they said, okay, this is my um, national interest, I have to negotiate with you. Um, um, we, we need something stronger than LDC guidelines for the LDCs, but you know, that was something that we followed that, um, our offer were below the, um, uh, much below the level of the, um, uh, that was determined in the LDC guideline. And even we were criticized at that time by the LDC's group that, okay, we fought for a certain thing in Afghanistan, didn't follow that, even they went much below that. So we wanted to be realistic, first thing, and that, that helped us a lot. Um, like we didn't go, for example, if the actual applied rate for a certain product is 5% and I would go for 100% bound rate, nobody will, you know, uh, accept that. So I would say, okay, let's go to 15 to 20% that. And that was based on our calculation. It was not something, you know, mathematical calculation set plus add minus this thing. No, we, we did work on that. We did our homework and we, um, we were um, quite realistic in our approach. Second thing, we were honest honest in a way that we didn't shy from putting a question or sharing our um, you know, problems with the member countries. Um, that was the uh, second thing. For example, in, in our case, we were sharing the draft laws um, with the WTO to share it with the uh, member countries. And that helped us a lot in two ways. The first, we um, uh, create confidence you know, in the partner because we are not hiding anything. We are putting everything on the table that they can look at it. Second, the benefit was that, that we were enriching our laws because law, you normally don't make it for one year or five months or six months. You want a kind of law that will help you build your system based on that. And um, my, my own thinking was that some of my colleagues, they were not um, agreeing to that. And also most of the member in WTO, they, uh, they were quite surprised and shocked that how they are sharing their laws, draft law even before it's passed. Because for me, it was that I wanted a document which uh, reflect the um, kind of practical experience of other countries for me. So we will enrich that law and based on that, we will move ahead uh, with our work. The third thing was that uh, we were quite honest while sitting in the working party meeting, answering the question because uh, answering the question in the process, we were just up to the point straightforward. If there was any difficulty, we were saying that is difficult. If we were not accepting anything, we would come with justification. And our um, position was that either to convince other, if you can't convince them, you know, accept that. So that those were the things that it helped us in the process uh, to move ahead. But the most important was that, that I was having frequent interaction with the accession division. Um, like um, I was on WhatsApp with almost every um, member of the accession division. So I would say, okay, can you tell me what is this? Can you help me in this thing? Can you do this thing? The same I would do uh, with the um, other member countries that we were negotiating. Like I would interact with them um, through unofficial channels directly. Okay, ha, huh, can you tell me that? Can we have a phone call to discuss this thing? So these things matters. And the most important thing, which is um, the last thing is um, that the two way interaction that you should do be, uh, you know, behind your negotiation first, use um, your influence and your capital on the member countries, political offices, embassies, talk to your embassies that you they're negotiating with you, take them into the confidence, talk to their economic counselors, talk to their commercial attache, talk to their, you know, all those people, take them on your side, uh, build that confidence. Second thing, best based in Geneva, go and visit that um, offices, embassies. Um, like when I was in Geneva for a working party meeting, instead of spending one or two days in there, I would have one week and I would go to the WTO offices all around, sit with one and other person to, to create a kind of confidence. Then I would go to the embassies, um, you know, the representative, permanent representative WTO, you know, those countries that that matters a lot. And I would sit with them, you know, I will just have a cup of tea with them uh, and generally discuss all those things. So that would increase the um, confidence. And if you are stuck sometime with negotiators in Geneva, you know, try to reach their capitals. You know, like I did in, in case of the um, United States and, and EU, for example, with the United States, I travel all the way to Washington 
and I went to the State Department, I went to USTR, I went to Department of Commerce, I went to USAID, you know, I reached everyone and I told them, look, Afghanistan accession is quite important. You have to support us in the process. And some of the, those things that political influence help us in concluding, you know, the rules side with the United States that they were having concern. With the European Union, we, we, we were stuck with few items, uh, like we, we didn't agree with each other. They were not able to convince us and we were not able to convince them. So I opted to go to Brussels like to speak to their director general for international trade. And I told them, look, your negotiator is so tough that they, they are not doing this. And, and I'm putting this logical reason for that. Um, you know, I need your support. And in and, and one video conference, we, we solve a problem. We couldn't do it in three round of bilateral negotiation. So these are the things that help you in, uh, uh, you know, in a rapid conclusion of your accession process. Thanks a lot, Mozemil, for, for your answer. Um, now I would like to give the floor to Jeremy. Um, Jeremy, you've been uh, very active throughout the Accessions Week, and I know you have burning questions for any of our panelists. So I would uh, give you the floor to uh, pose your question. Thank you, uh, Maria. Uh, well, my question first to Mozemil and uh, the second one to both of them. Uh, uh, well, as I have said, uh, the, now is WTO accession is not an option. It's becoming a necessity because, you know, uh, almost 98% uh, uh, of the trade, the global trade is among the members. And whether we like it or not, we are also trading uh, within that rules and regulations. Uh, but uh, after accession, even though uh, it is uh, five, it, I think it's in uh, 2015 that Afghanistan become a member. Even though five years is not a, small, a short time, uh, have you made any, any uh, impact assessment that accession to the WTO uh, reflected in your uh, uh, economy in general, and you know it can maybe it, it might not a direct uh, impact, but even indirectly. The second question, both of you, uh, Muzamil and Jemmy, uh, uh, Najib, uh, referred to reform, and you emphasized on domestic. Uh, reforms. <laughs> reforms must be self-initiated because you have to you have to evaluate the global uh, environment yourself. The country should evaluate the global environment and make you know uh, compatible to that environment. Otherwise, you will be left out. And that's why uh, my government is taking uh serious uh, reforms uh, uh in the uh years uh ahead and uh, in 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 my view we are almost trying to to uh make compatible the whole uh, system or the whole trading system compatible to the uh, uh WTO. but sometimes the re forms requested by members or uh, the, by the system might be beyond the capacity of uh, uh, the uh, uh, regulating capacity of the country. Have you faced such situation and how did you solve it? Thank you. Um, the first thing that the um, direct or indirect impact let, let me put one thing um, to uh, all LDCs. You know, WTO accession is not something, a kind of magic stick that, you know, you just get it and you change everything. You know, we, we understand the um, localities. We understand our domestic, you know, functioning system, how it's moving on. For a small thing, you have to go, you know, you have to work for years. Like, in my view, personally, when we were negotiating, I was not expecting anything sooner 
to be done for Afghanistan. My aim was 15 to 20 to 30 years because by the time we have um, we are extracting our natural resources by the time we are extracting our oil and gas, are developing those oil and gas fields, um, you know, mineral, um, lithium, because we are one of the world, uh, you know, we are having uh, one of the world largest uh, lithium reserve in Afghanistan. So all those things, you know, we will not be in the same situation where we are today. And if we delay everything by that time, so then it will be quite difficult for us to exit because everybody will be having, um, you know, their own interests in certain areas, which they don't have right now. So um, to be specific, in certain areas, yes, like in the laws, you know, we um, committed ourselves in the process, we, we had those laws. Like 30 plus legal document were developed, it was not an easy thing. And now it is implementing. Um, you know some of the laws regarding the intellectual property and all those things. It will be. It will. It is due to be. You know to start implementation. Um, 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 you know by the end of this year. You know the basic thing. Like one thing I will tell you: intellectual property registration. We had a kind of system before that everything would go to the court, and you know. A judge who was sitting on the commercial court who understood the commercial uh, activities, but he didn't have that much knowledge about the intellectual property and IP related, and they would go just everything by book and do whatever they wanted. For example, if I was getting a regency or you know a franchise of a company, uh, the person would apply for the registration that you know uh, a, a trademark of that company. So what the court will give them a kind of certificate that he is the person, he has the ownership of this thing for next 10 years, for example. Maybe that franchise was given for three years or something like, he automatically get that for 10 years. If the owner of the same company from outside, he come and he want to register by his name, he couldn't do that for 10 years. He would go, he would have to go through the process because he said it is registered by the name of someone else. So that was the classical system we used to have. What we did based on that, we established the intellectual property registration office and ministry of commerce. And now they are doing all those things. Even they started doing the patents, uh, the trademark, you know, the overall thing that what, what you can do it um, in, in, a, uh, in an LDC and especially, for example, talking about a one son. But um, now come indirect effect. Five years back, our export was around 500 million. Today, it's more than 1 billion. So it's somehow double. I won't say it just because of the WTO accession or the direct impact of WTO accession, but it is the indirect um, you know, impact um, on our trade. You know, why I just exactly mentioned the um, export, when we were finalizing our accession, our president asked us a um, simple three question. He said, okay, first, bring me the data of all exceeding members, last 20 exceeding members, how much their export increased, how much their in economy improved, um, you know, how much the investment uh, improved in the transit problem in dispute settlement process, how many are won by the landlocked countries and all those things. So we work at that time, you know, for us collecting those information was not an easy thing, you know, like 20 countries that they lately exceeded. So the interesting thing was that the graph of all of those, um, you know, were going high, even with less or more, but it's going high. So uh, in our case, like right now, we have all legal document uh, which were required for the um, having a proper um, uh, private sector um, you know, uh, supporting a legal document, we have that in our export increased, um, uh, you know, to more than 1 billion. Last year it touched 1 billion, so hope, hope we, are, we will do much better. Um, at the time when we had the insurgency increase in the country, when we had pro other problems were there. If those problems were not there, we could have achieved, um, you know, uh, a much uh, better um, in the process. Um, the second question, can you tell me what was the second question? Maybe Najib can answer that and after him I can answer the second question. Um, so Najib, uh, for the sake of keeping time, I'd like to ask you to keep your answer brief. 
uh, unmute, please. Unmute. Sorry, you can hear me now. Yes. So uh, the uh, commitments or reforms, you know, beyond the uh, exceeding country regulatory capacity, this is quite common. Uh, we've been through it. Other countries been uh, this has been uh, through it, and the direct answer is when you are asked to do certain things, uh, like uh, call it reforms or commitments under certain agreements if you can't you say you can't and 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 you start you know say uh, going to uh, uh, requesting or having a plan action plans they are called uh, taking into account a transitional period of time certain number of years of course you can aim high as high as you think you will need you know to comply with those uh, commitments uh, and we had that in several in several areas I can remember now the SBS, TBT, TREBS, uh, customs evaluation, trading rights uh, on good uh, on goods trade and also even in services if you have difficulties in implementing certain commitments immediately as that is upon accession or was the phrase used upon accession you commit then you can always also ask for uh, those transitional period uh, so the in, in it's you can't really from our experience at least and experiences that i know you can't escape you know uh, certain commitments especially if they are you know uh, in the agreements and if they uh, are reasonable and uh, uh, of you to 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 take uh, but uh, given the uh, lack of capacity, uh, including uh, uh, regulating capacity, as was the uh, question, uh, then you have you know this option. And uh, members usually they do not you know uh, see it an unreasonable you know kind of answer. It's always negotiable and always end up with certain number of years as transitional periods. Um, if I can just, um, I will just support what Najib said that uh, the first thing you should move ahead with that, that, okay, go. If you think uh, what they're asking um, is not good for your country and you think uh, this is one thing. So you take a firm position, try to convince them and use all whatever uh, resources that you are having go um, and utilize that, talking to their political representation, um, you know, talking, um, you know, to other that you can create pressure on them. Second thing that you can think it's good for your country, but right now it's difficult for you that to implement that. Um, as Najib mentioned, ask for transitional period. That is the best uh, possible way that you can move ahead with such kind of um, uh, request. Um, and if you think that is good for your country, a bit difficult, but if you can push for it, I think my suggestion would be that just stay to that uh, commitment, accept that, and you know, force your government, your internal institution to implement that because that is good for your country and you can accept that. Thanks a lot, uh, Mozamil and, and Najib, uh, for providing a very comprehensive answer to uh, uh, Francisco and Jeremy's question. Uh, just very briefly, do you have any questions for Jeremy and Francisco? <laughs> I have one if you allow me. Okay. Uh, Atobia, you see, I've, I've been closely uh, following on Atobia's accession, of course. Uh, our not far distant neighbor on the other side of the Red Sea. Uh, now, uh, maybe if Guillermo can share with us, you know, uh, the shortly in a brief way, the uh, difficulties faced, you know, with uh, preparing uh, market access of uh, offers. Uh, maybe that will be if if he can brief that. I know it's a long story, but uh, it will be uh, useful, you know, for other exceeding uh, LDCs to learn about. Thank you. 
So, Garamu, you have two minutes, Max. Uh, two minutes for a uh, question of an hour. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, uh, when we prepare our uh, market access offer, especially for goods, uh, we uh, did a module which will uh, consider uh, if we liberalize as usual, uh, reduce tariff uh, on a certain product, what will be the impact on domestic industries, uh, on government revenue, on employment generation, and the model will give us some, you know, taking the applied tariff, which we are using now, and uh, which we are uh, planning if we face any problem to uh, increase, the bound rate, which we are going to uh, uh, offer. So we use that model, and it's, it's not like uh, across the board increase, uh, like uh, by 50%, by 80%, or 100%. It is the model that decides the applied tariffs that we are uh, going to uh, uh, offer. Then we submitted the initial offer to members on the third uh, working party meeting. There was no as such uh, objection except a uh, few comments, but we came back again and revised our goods offer to, uh, you know, to, to, to speed up the process. And now we have a revised uh, goods offer. We have submitted our initial uh, service commitment. which We are uh, now receiving questions from members. Thank you, Garamu. Um, so I guess there is no other question. Uh, um, just before we conclude, because um, we're supposed to do a Q&A segment uh, in this, sec in this uh, session, and we, we have, I'm just going to ask one question out of uh, the questions we receive. Um, someone is asking, Afghanistan's accession is quite a successful story. When looking back, is there anything that you think Afghanistan could have done better? Uh, that question is directed to Mozamil. Um, you know, uh, uh, when time passes, you know, things get changed. Like what we were uh, in 2011, we are not in 2020. Um, you know, in most of the areas, I think I myself, I'm quite satisfied that what we have done, um, it, it was much better. Uh, of course, you know, people would come and people would talk about, you know, many things. For example, for us, for example, the right now, um, our ambassador in, in Geneva, uh, he's leading a G7 plus um, one, I think something like that. And then he's also the chair of the Trade Facilitation Committee. You know, those are the things that we, we aim for it, like to be part of the, um, um, you know, decision-making body and all those things. This was one of the reasons that we always wanted to be part of the prestigious club that, you know, you, you have a voice there, your voice is heard there. And you can sit in the, um, on the chair that normally you wouldn't imagine for that. You can uh, make the uh, kind of rules um, or pave the way for rules uh, that you were not able to do it before. So I think, um, you know, I I'm quite satisfied with the work we have done and hopefully that in future it will be also proven that uh, whatever we negotiated, um, it, it was helping us uh, as well as we will be able to utilize that for the other neighbors, our neighbors that they're coming to the uh, WTO like Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan and Iran, that we will be able to negotiate with them and to take whatever we wanted uh, to take from the accession. Thank you very much, Monzamil. Um, with that, let me just conclude by saying that I have, uh, I'm gonna leave this session uh, richer in knowledge, in accession knowledge, and I hope all of you have, and I hope uh, our over 50 attendees have as well. Uh, thank you all for sharing your experience. Um, this session is being recorded and will be made available to a broader audience to also 
you know, get to see, experience the wonderful session we just had. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank our distinguished panelists, our attendees uh, for this wonderful session. The Accessions Week is not over yet. We have one more session uh, that will start at 2.30 and it's on uh, public-private uh, dialogue. So please stay tuned for one additional session which starts at 2.30. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you.